Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome uh, to this afternoon's conversation with uh, historian Michael Geyer. I am Aisha Challer. I am a permanent fellow at, at the IWM, and I am also a professor at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology in, at the Vienna University. And I'm uh, very pleased and honored to introduce uh, Michael Geyer uh, to those of you who do not know him yet. Um, Michael Geyer is uh, uh, as a historian. Uh, he is a Samuel Harper Professor of History Emeritus from Chicago University. He was at the Chicago University teaching from between 1986 at the University of Chicago until 2015 when he became emeritus and he's still uh, there. And before joining uh, University of Chicago History Department, he was at Michigan uh, and Arbor. Um, uh, Mihai, um, Michael, I'm, I, sometimes I, I get uh, confused, Michael or Michael, because uh, you, I mean, because he has also written in German and published in German and English and had the PhD in in Germany. So the uh, the moment that the titles change, I change to Michael too, and if it is in uh, in uh, German. And uh, uh, Michael Geyers, uh, um, in terms of, I'm not going to walk you through the uh, uh, very impressive CV, but I will just mention that he has been a fellow at uh, American Academy in Berlin several times. He has received the Humboldt uh, Forschungs uh, Award in 2006 and, and also Guggenheim Fellowship in 2004. His areas of research is, in terms of regionally, it is concentrated on European history and particularly Germany, 20th century uh, German uh, history. And uh, in terms of areas of interest and then the specialization and where his uh, research and publications are concentrated. Of course, he's known as a uh, uh, military historian. That is history of military, war, uh, violence, genocide, and military uh, culture. But his publications cover a very broad range. Uh, um, and they are, um, uh, they are interrelated, but you could cluster them and within, uh, uh, other than the military history that you could cluster them in engagement with global history, transnational uh, history, and a history of globalization, you could say, um, in uh, general. He has, his publications are in those areas. I will just give you a kind of couple of titles to give you a taste of the uh, research and the publications that for those of you who are not familiar with his work, one, for example, uh, A Shattered Past, Reconstructing German Histories, and Deutsche Rüstungspolitik, 1860 bis 1980, German Armaments Policies and Politics, 1860 to 1980, for those of you who do not uh, understand uh, German. And also he has an edited uh, volume on so Geopolitik und Psychopolitik des Ersten Weltkriegs uh, with, together with two intellectuals who are quite well known to uh, Vienna uh, intellectual scene, Helmut Lettner and uh, uh, Lutz Müssner from EFK. And uh, another total war, economy, society, culture, at uh, war. Um, 
he has been a pioneer uh, in, um, in the debates in bringing and opening up the uh, global history and transnational history. He's actually a editor of a serious transnational uh, history uh, series. And he has. Um, mm, he has publications in that uh, in that area, but he was really a forerunner in those debates before debates about uh, global history uh, and transnational history acquired some kind of prominence uh, within uh, debates in his history and some other uh, other uh, fields. Um, uh, his, uh, he has uh, worked on history of religion, but uh, it is, I found it very difficult to categorize your work in terms of whether to history of religion or where does, for example, what could be categorized that his very important essay on Marshall Hodgkin could be categorized maybe for history of religion, but also I think it is a very good example of engagement, a very critical engagement with global history and transnational, uh, transnational history. So within also that is this, this uh, I will give you the title of this article, this essay, because I think it is um, it's very important for not for the historians only, that's for many others. The invention of world history from the spirit of nonviolent resistance and kind of unearthing uh, Hodgkin's work very um, in the 40s, 50s, his work that uh, bringing into our attention. So in, in all these areas, I think there is a common thread that uh, uh, connecting all, uh, all these, and then I think all these areas, and I think we could see the thread about the consequences, or in fact, discontents of the fiction of nation state as an autonomous, sovereign subject in terms of history writing in terms of analysis of social economic processes identified as internal, as uh, national, and in terms of the affective interior spheres of individuals in terms of their sense of, uh, uh, sense of uh, place, a, a sense of the self, actually. So he uh, actually, all the pro uh, points he addresses are related to mistaking of nation, uh, nation as the encasement of the processes that are taking place within the national uh, territory, so-called the interior. And for those of you that in other disciplines, actually, this is where uh, we try to, uh, in my disciplines, uh, sociology and anthropology, we try to address this within methodological uh, uh, nationalism. And um, I think that uh, in addition to that, I would, I mean, it's such a broad, uh, broad profile. In addition to that, those kind of the, uh, micro histories, small histories, minor histories that uh, show the impossibility of encasement of the histories within national frames, and that his family history, that the uh, his essay on a family history, the Bratus sketch for a minor German history, is a very uh, good example for that. And uh, lastly, that I mean, uh, um, where. We, uh, which takes us to our today's conversation is that, as I said, that the nation state and the engagement and the discontents of that the uh, nation uh, state uh, is the common thread, as that he has worked on the contradictions that his essays cover and his publications on the contradictions in Rhodes and um, 
uh, disjunctures that nation states and the sovereignties uh, uh, are faced in the globalized uh, world and what kind of uh, how that the boundaries get blurred and what kind of affective politics that they give rise uh, to and to kind of today's uh, topic in terms of that the, when nations panic that they are the sovereignty uh, sovereignty pa pa uh, panics so I think there is a very uh, very strong thread and I would like to ask uh, the first question before we go to the evil uh, twin evils of imperialism, nationalism, and uh, sovereignty panics, um, where do you see a kind of uh, uh, signs and the presence of uh, emotional language and effects uh, in talking about societies and nations that we are all we are talking now that the, uh, there is a kind of politics of effect, effect of politics. But where do you see these uh, these signs and their increase or or spread and uh, in this society? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, uh, the first time I saw this emotional impact of talking about nations in the process of globalization, I saw it and I didn't see it. I saw it with my eyes wide shut, if you wish. <laughs> uh, and this was in uh, fall of 2007 and early 2008, that is before the financial uh, crash. Mm -hmm. When I gave a talk in Cologne uh, and then again in Rostock with the title, uh, the title is a bit racy, but still it uh, was a serious academic exercise, I thought, and it, it was, uh, uh, with the title Deutschland in der Globalisierungsfalle. Um, my friends and colleagues at the University of Cologne made the mistake of publishing uh, uh, this workshop uh, presentation and as a result some 200, 300 people showed up. So, and they showed up because they felt there is a problem there. Germany being in a trap. Uh, and that is indeed the question that I want, uh, that, uh, that I raised and I tried to answer. Uh, the question simply being, why is it that a nation who clearly becomes rich in the process of globalization is at the same time so deadly scared about globalization. Now, the present, I'd have to say, was not on my mind in 2007, 2008. It was the past I was interested in. Uh, it was anglophobia I wanted to know. Ultimately, I wanted to establish the kind of global project of, of the right-wing right nationalists and then of the, of the national socialists uh, in Germany. Uh, so that was the kind of, that was the ideas I wanted to pursue, but effectively, obviously, it addressed very distinctly a present audience who thought about Germany in the present and felt exactly that there is a problem in the present. Now, in the meantime, of course, uh, we do have a very well-recognized problem uh, when a certain president talks about patriotism, uh, patriotism versus globalism, when uh, a certain pr uh, prime minister argues that there cannot be a global citizen, there must be only local citizens, when Moreover, you get, and I had to write this down, you get quotes like this. Uh, you, you do wonder, in this case, who is crazier, uh, the writers, uh, the journalists, or the politicians. Uh, first quote comes from a, a, a well-recognized, uh, very sober, uh, liberal journal uh, magazine, liberal magazine, 
The Economist, uh, September 25th, just a few days ago, arguing in a language that, that interests me, pra Brexit has infected British politics from top to bottom. Note, infected. To cure the fever, note the language, uh, will require another vote. No British institution is any longer immune to the Brexit virus. What we have, in other words, and this is the language of the journalist, this is the language of the economist, this is not the language of a politician, though we, there are many quotes of politicians as well. What we have, the idea that there is a contagion going around, and that is exactly you know, in some way, what I want to understand as uh, what I would like to understand, not just as a present, but since I'm a historian, uh, as a historical phenomenon. What's going on here when journalists, respected journalists, use language that reminds you very distinctly of a highly charged, highly emotional, ideological language. Give you another quote. Uh, this one is from a well-known, well-regarded uh, uh, South African, uh, but mostly American by now, uh, American-European uh, journalist, uh, Roger Cohen, New York Times. Uh, indeed, uh, it was yesterday. Uh, this is about uh, the Ukraine, right, and a certain American president. Uh, language that is unheard of in the New York Times, uh, although it's an op-ed piece, still amazing. Now the shrieking maniac is shrieking louder, shrieking of spies and, uh, and treason, and a good uh, chunk of the United States will shriek with him. What's going on here? What is this language all about? Why this extraordinary outburst of, of very, otherwise very sober, often, at least in the case of The Economist, quite statistically convincing, in, this, in both cases, liberal journalists. Now, in fact, what happens here is, of course, very, in some ways, unfortunate for a historian. Because what happens is that a, an intellectual project, a historical project, is literally overrun by, run over, and overrun by the present. And what I, what I think we will do, to some extent, in our conversation, is to reconstruct a genealogy of this present. This is a method, I should say, that uh, uh, was not pioneered, but articulated a very, uh, some 50 years, uh, by now 60 years ago, in a short text, Introduction to History by Geoffrey Baraclaw, that inspired me greatly back in the 70s when I was in, at the University of Freiburg and then in Oxford. Uh, Geoffrey Baraclaw argued that what we need to understand as, contempor uh, as contemporary historians is the genealogy of the present. Where is the beginning, where is the source, or what are the sources, and where are the sources of mm -hmm. our present condition. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, the project that the way, the way I would now mm -hmm. formulate mm -hmm. it. Okay, but uh, immediately in relation to that, as a historian, of course, that the genealogies are very important to understand the, uh, to understand the present. Sorry, I have this tendency, thanks. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, that very, um, a quick analogies are uh, made to in relation to, um, of course, uh, with Trump, immediately fascism, so with the past and then the present. Uh, with Trump, 
Orban or Erdogan, that is immediately what is what is happening is in terms of that uh, in relation to uh, fascism. So. Um, Yes, in terms of the genealogies, but what would you say for those kind of immediate uh, connections as an historian? Yes, this is a, this is a very interesting uh, and a very intriguing question of how we approach uh, uh, the past uh, if we want to understand uh, it as a source of the present. The easiest way to do, and it was done relentlessly uh, after 2016, and is still done relentlessly, uh, is to, to pick out some past that, uh, and, and mostly the most prominent past you can think of. So if you have a nationalist uh, in power, what do you think of? Well, you think the first thing is, of course, you compare him to national socialism, and more appropriately, because you're among academics, and national socialism uh, is a little bit difficult to use. You, th you link, him, uh, you link this, uh, uh, this person and his ideas to fascism, right? So you make a one-on-one -on -one comparison. I find uh, it can be done, but I think it's wrong. Uh, it's wrong in that, in the sense that what is abandoned in the in the process is the historical process uh, that moves from the, the the historical dynamic that moves from one situation, namely the 1920s and the 1930s, its conditions and its solutions among which fascism and national, national socialism was a, were a prominent part through the, the next half century and more into the present in which, depending on where, where you are and who you are, if you are in Germany, you're still kind of fighting and dealing with the heritage of national socialism. In the case of the United States, who knows what Trump actually, our president actually knows and what he doesn't know and what he picks up and what he doesn't pick up. Uh, what is interesting is that there is a continuity or there is an element of a politics in which the nation becomes utterly and absolutely central and in which the nation is linked with something that academics have almost forgotten or torn apart in intellectual analysis or found insufficient, found hypocritical, found, uh, found outright non-usable, and that is the term sovereignty. I mean, the, the, the number of times I have heard officials in present governments less in Central Europe, less in Germany, actually not in Germany at all, uh, to some extent in Austria, but certainly in the United States and in Great Britain, that the number of times I have uh, heard them speak about the nation and the nation as a sovereign entity is, is, was, is absolutely astounding. So you have a, re, a, a retrieval of a kind of historical of a vocabulary that had kind of been pushed, uh, never gone away. The nation certainly hasn't gone away, but which has been pushed in the background and is, uh, is re-articulated in the present. Now the present, however, is somewhat different than the past. This said, for me personally, I had to revisit a number of <laughs> what I thought the bad yeah. histories. So, you know, what you return to uh, uh, when you see uh, uh, when you see steel and iron ore producers in the Upper Peninsula mm -hmm. of Michigan kind of being activated, arguing for national security and sovereignty, you see basically a, a return uh, for me. Uh, mm -hmm. It resonates with the old Staatsmonopol capitalismus, mm -hmm. which we all got, uh, learned backwards and forwards mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. It looks like it, at least the way it's debated, mm -hmm. uh, if coal industry as the uh, uh, as, as the classic Herr im Hause kind of poly, uh, 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 industrialists kind of reassert their dominance. Uh, it, it really, in the first instance, it looks like real bad history to me that mm -hmm. becomes reality and you revisit the past in that sense. So, uh, but it also means that we do have to re reconfigure uh, our own thinking mm -hmm. and wonder maybe we've abandoned some ideas mm -hmm. too fast. Yeah. And I mean, with the sovereignty, I would like to come immediately to that. This day when nations panic, you use also the term sovereignty panics. So I would like you to expand a little bit on that what these what kind of panics we are talking yeah. about and what are the issues that are i mean uh, what are the sources of those uh, panics and how do they manifest themselves and so that bringing the sovereignty concept that you started yeah. which is very important and central but also uh, how those uh, dilemmas of sovereignty unfold in time but also in space but what the panics are about yeah it's interesting you know i've used this term souveränitätspanik mm -hmm. in 2007 mm -hmm. 8 i never published a paper i never uh, uh, but it it is it became something of a viral meme in uh, in among certain historians who picked it up and picked it up further and uh, whatever they mean. Uh, for me, I think I could get straight at the de uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the definition, but let me mm -hmm. let me turn this mm -hmm. round because there is a, 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 in terms of grand historical developments. One of the defining forces of the 19th and 20th century European and certainly global history is self-determination, Selbstbestimmung. Now, Selbstbestimmung is a slippery word. It is coined as a word and as a concept in the 18th century, but refers very distinctly to the, uh, to the individual as subject. In fact, it defines the individual, the ability out of your free will and uncoerced to make decisions. And for Almost a century, uh, you can actually trace the Begriffsgeschichte, you know, and uh, the historians um, among you know this is classic Koselleck, Reinhard Koselleck, the doyen of all German historians of the post-war uh, post era. You can follow the Begriffsgeschichte and you see it remains very distinctly uh, debated, uh, very intensively debated, uh, 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 as a, a, a subject, uh, 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 as an individual, ter a term for individual subjects. But by the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, something interesting happens. And this is going to define the rest of the late 19th century and then the 20th century. The individual term is rebranded as a term for collective identities and is beginning in the mid-century, and this is a German development and simultaneously a French development, it is associated with nationalities. Ethnicities become nationalities in pursuit of self-determination. This is long before Woodrow Wilson kind of used the term in a different context after World War I uh, in the peace negotiations. This is, a, uh, this, is a, uh, uh, this is a term that 
gains collective valence and retains collective valence in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, and becomes a dominant term in 1916, 17, 18, 19, mostly in a European context, and is appropriated and jumps over into a global term in the, uh, in the Second World War and then after the Second World War in the emerging, what we for simplicity's sake would call the Third World. Now, that's a, let's leave it at that. Uh, and becomes the term that inspires this movement that then defines the 20th century. That is the mass secession from empire. Okay. First, the mass secession from empires like the Habsburg empires, uh, Habsburg empire or the Ottoman empire or the Russian empire, but then the secession from the maritime empires from Great Britain and France and then Portugal and, uh, and Spain and the, uh, and the Dutch, etc. Now, in this context, and this gets me finally, sorry, for <laughs> in a very winded way back to the issue of self-determination, <clears throat> what did this mean? The intellectuals, certainly, the writers and the politicians, both in uh, Europe and then subsequently in the Third World, thought and hoped and expected that out of dependence with the creation of a self-dependent political unit, a nation or a nation state, would come a certain autonomy of decision making, very distinctly a certain sovereignty uh, that is control over one's own future. But what do they discover? Well, None of them, although they have now their own, what technically is called, you know, what political scientists call, although they have now their own polity or have their own decision-making space, they make decisions, they make laws, they have power, no doubt, but this power, think of Poland, think of Czechoslovakia, or think of Austria, if you wish, uh, but also think of a kind of Germany that gets smaller and smaller after 1945. Think of all European nations, and then think of all the third world nations. This power neither guarantees that you can provide the security for your citizens, because s small and medium-sized nations can be wiped out any time. Not any, they are not wiped, being wiped out any time, but the potential is there. You cannot defend yourself, which is a classic element of sovereignty. Wealth, well, think of the Austrian uh, uh, crash in 1922, 20, the, finance, uh, the financial crash. Wealth cannot be produced internally. Uh, it needs a world to do that. Welfare is the same. You depend on the world to produce, uh, to produce a level of welfare for your nation, and ultimately even identity is not homemade, although you try, but it is, uh, international, it is internationally made, as present German nationalists uh, uh, complain about endlessly <laughs> when they talk about the Holocaust, right? That's just one example of many. In any case, the long and the short of it is that you discover, and you discover with the, with the suddenness of, of reality descending on you becoming a nation state, you discover that you have your nation, you have your state, but the sovereignty, the ability to control your own destiny, to, whether you're a citizen state or a civic nation or whether you're an autocracy, that escapes you. And that is the situation which is negotiated differently in different countries. It should be said, there is, not, there is not one response, but this is a situation in which panics can emerge, in which people then, or 
writers and politicians desperately try to figure out how can we overcome this gap? How can we make our nation truly sovereign? Okay, but it is truly sovereign, but in the sense that, I mean, the dilemmas of the borders, that it is, this is, uh, you have, in a way, what you were showing is that, uh, telling us is that this transnational constitution of the nation state, yeah. and that the, the processes, that it is the wealth generation could not be encased uh, within. But uh, what are the, um, in terms of the panics, in terms of the effects, that what are the kind of the mechanisms that this is, yes, you can't control your future destiny as, as a nation, but where, uh, what I find very interesting is that the, the uh, unpacking the mechanisms behind the emotions in terms of the psyche or in terms of the affective aspect of it. What does it do to, uh, the, to the uh, citizens or the people mm -hmm. of, those peop of those who have rooted their ideas, identities in a national, uh, national frame and what kind of mechanisms it unleashes. So that is, uh, I think, is very important. I mean, or I would be very interested to hear in terms of the nature of those panics. Take yeah, yeah. and we see a kind of a similarity. Uh, in those kind of the panics. Yeah. So it should be hitting a very important nerve. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, permit me again to go through several stages, okay? Uh, in the end, I will come to the actual <laughs> panic uh, because uh, I don't want to use panic just for everything yes. and anything. But let's put it, first of all, for nationalists after World War I, which is where I'm work, uh, which is what I'm working about at the moment. Mm -hmm. For nationalists after World War I, and certainly for nationalists in Africa uh, in, the 19, in, in the Caribbean in the 1960s and 70s, uh, there is just a, a, a wonderful book has been published by my colleague uh, in political science, Adam Getachev, uh, about world making. Fabulous book on exactly this phenomenon. So we know pretty well what's going on here. For nationalists, for your, your garden variety nationalists who grew up or came out of the 19th century, this was a rude shock. This was a rude shock uh, that mostly came uh, with, uh, 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 in the context of the direct interference of outside forces within the country. So minority laws were the classic case celebre. Then uh, 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 what uh, some Austrians, not Mr. Schumpeter, but some Austrians uh, uh, thought of finance imperialism descending on Austria, stabilizing against the Austrian will uh, the, 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 uh, the, the currency. Those things kind of exploded. Uh, and they led, uh, and, but that is, that is kind of ordinary nationalism grown up with the expectation of sovereignty, kind of boxing its way around in, uh, uh, you know, finding its way in a world in which they discover they need others, they need, uh, the world is not, uh, the world is not flat. But ultimately, it's the French, it's the British, or the Americans. It's not even Washington, but New York, who defines what's going on. Or it's, if it's not Washington and New York, it's Geneva in the case of finance, right? Uh, so that's a discovery that is some shock, and that needs to all sorts of uh, uh, all sorts reverberations. Uh, you can actually trace anti-Semitism in that context. You can trace uh, uh, an intensification of xenophobias against minorities. You can uh, find, you know, what uh, what you study, uh, complex border regimes uh, are being for the first time really erected. Passports are a new thing, but border controls uh, are, you know, that is. 
something that there should be a border somewhere between Bohemia and Bavaria. That is something that you have to find out first, uh, and that takes takes a while. It it it, it happens, uh, but it happens in a, in a long, complex, and then ultimately very violent process. But that's kind of the garden variety nationalism that is intense enough. Now, fascism or radical nationalism is kind of nationalism on steroids, if you want. That solution is, uh, well, first of all, it is uh, uh, gaining truly mass support, mass mobilizing the nation, mediate, mediating a national consciousness with all means possible. Uh, that is, that is, uh, that is, you know, something that has to be invented is pioneered uh, uh, by socialists, but is most successfully done by fascists. In the process, we discover that nationalism, while media fabricated, is amaz an amazing resource of mobilizing people. Indeed, uh, we will discover in World War II, and uh, uh, the Soviet Union here is the best case, nationalism is actually the far superior way of mobilizing the nation than socialism. Uh, you, need to, you need a turn to an indigenous national, a Russian nationalism, in order to mobilize the nation. nation uh, nationalism, in any case, is made in the interwar years, and fascists are at the forefront of it, it Italy being the paragon, is absolutely central, uh, is, uh, is, is absolutely central in devising methods and ideas and practices of, mo of mass mobilization. This comes in the context of a second idea, also pioneered not simply by fascists, but by a first generation of, uh, of, of, of radical nationalists, uh, though the, the Italians, again, Italian fascism was the one with, with staying power. Basically, the new nations, Poland, Romania, Greece was an old nation, but had hopes to renew itself, and Italy all thought the way to sovereignty is to become a national empire, to expand. In the Polish case, it is expanding into, down into the Ukraine, uh, uh, t basically taking over all of Galicia, uh, Galicia and a good part of the Ukraine. In the Greek case, you had this huge disaster, one of the greatest disasters in the aftermath of World War I, the Greek-Turkish War, uh, which, which swallowed hundreds of thousands of people. It was a, a, a genuine disaster. And of course, in, it, in Italy, you have the combination in the first instance uh, uh, of, uh, of, of media, uh, ce media celebrity and violence in, in, in Trieste and then in Fiume, Rijeka, right? Uh, there you have the ideal combination of all three. So that's, a different, that's already a different stage. You have to expand in order to survive. Now for the national, so all of this I would not call sovereignty panic. I, I would think of this as possibly false thinking and certainly disastrous thinking in some cases. But I think sovereignty panic would have to be reserved uh, to the most powerful of these nations, and that is uh, uh, Germany, uh, in which, and that has to do with how Germans and how German nationalists in particular came to uh, terms with the defeat in World War I. Uh, the defeat could not be denied. You could not say we are not defeated. You know, uh, in reality you were because you know. But what you could create is a world of explanation that deflected from the military defeat, right? 
and created and, and which, which, was, which was hard to bear. And you could argue, we were never militarily defeated, but you had to switch, so to speak, to a fantastic world in which the 400,000 Jews in Germany or 500,000 Jews in Germany were responsible for, uh, for, for overthrowing a nation, or for, for, for uh, dissolving a nation of 40, 50 million, right? Uh, and, and were capable of defeating, uh, defeating uh, uh, and thus were de capable of defeating uh, 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 Germany uh, from within. This process is indeed at, 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 uh, at the center of sovereignty panic. It is when, the, when, when you have a disjuncture between the world as it is, that is the reality of military defeat and the world that you want to be, uh, 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 which is a world that you cannot accept and a kind of alternative world explanation that gives you a way out in fiction and fantasy. Now, this fiction and fantasy makes the Jews very particularly the source of German defeat, which is in a very straight line. There are many other things added, but in a very straight line, which leads right to 1939, when Hitler, in his famous Reichstag speech, argues, if we ever get to a world war, rather than these isolated little wars, uh, if we ever get the world to a world war, it's going to be the end of the Jews. Now, this is not yet the moment of Auschwitz, but this is a very important transition. Add to this a wider discussion in which you reflect, which you develop ideas. What actually would it take for Germany to be sovereign, to, to be able to fight a war? Well, the answer it is, is you have to become, and this happens within months, it happens between 1923, 1924, no, 1923, 1924, 25, the idea becomes fixed. You have to create Europe, uh, uh, absolute European hegemony. You have to defeat and control uh, the Soviet Union in order to get the Ukraine and in order to get the oil fields of Baku, in order to have a Großraum that is capable of fighting off the glo uh, fighting off world powers and gain sovereignty. So, yeah. Okay, I mean uh, this is uh, this this uh, this tour is very nice, but on the other hand, that is what makes this dissonance in a way this this juncture today much more uh, prominent, so that this affective politics are taking again a kind of an upper hand and. Well, uh, do, uh, I liked uh, in your work very much the way that you uh, look at this um, spatial and temporal unfolding of those dissonance. And so, and the closing question would be because of time that uh, what happens to uh, this dissonance, particularly in the context of quote unquote small nations? Yeah. And I mean, today is also election day, and uh, we know what kind of effective politics are going on here, and is there anything about that? But what is this? Is what accentuates this kind of dissonance and disorientation that you're talking about between the external world and the kind of a reality need mm -hmm. to create a kind of a reality which tries to overcome that yeah. uh, dissonance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you've heard at the beginning uh, uh, my, uh, maybe, uh, my opposition to straight comparisons mm -hmm. between f uh, fascism, national socialism, and whatever, mm -hmm. present right radicalism, whatever mm -hmm. the connection is. What's the difference between the situation in the 1930s 
and the 19 and the 2010s. But the most relevant difference, I think, is that today the state no longer even claims to guarantee the borders. That claims to to guarantee the the security, as it were, and the and the inviolability of of borders. What we have is a very peculiar phenomenon. We have a situation in which every individual citizen becomes his or her own foreign minister. I mean, in this world, which I find a perfectly normal world, I should say, but in this world, it is you, not the state, who negotiates relations between cultures, between different languages, between ethnics. In the 1920s, you could have the fiction that if Poland were truly Poland, everyone would speak Polish and everyone would be Polish. Well, the fiction is still the same in Poland today, but the reality in Austria and the reality in Germany, and I think ultimately it's a good reality, is that we have a very significant population that has, is new to Germany, is new to Austria, speaks foreign languages, uh, brings different kinds of customs, will be merged eventually in one way or the other, and the Austrians and the Germans will have to figure out how to do it, but in which, and that is the crucial point, everyone, you, me, and everyone in the street is asked to do the policy and the politics that 50 years ago was naturally assumed to be done by the state. Now, nationalists, ethno-nationalists in particular, hope and assume that the state could come back into this role, that borders could be tightened. But frankly, I think given, given the world as it is, this is fiction. This is, uh, this is fiction and this is a policy that will necessarily, not today or tomorrow, but in the course of time, break down. What the better solution is and what the more realistic solution is, is to rethink, now since I'm an American now in my old age, is to rethink what the American melting pot is today. Uh, today in which the average immigrant is not a Jew from Russia or a Romanian or a, uh, a Pole or an Italian or a Turk, but is, a, is from China or is from Central America or is from whichever, or is from Africa, actually significant, uh, there is a significant African immigration. So you will have to figure, reconfigure this. Germans, Poles, Austrians, Czechs will have to answer these questions for them, themselves. What we need is a debate an intense debate which actually happens, and this is what you study, right? This is your field, not mine, uh, is how to work, in, uh, how, to create, how to create society in a world in which you have a remixing of populations uh, after the great violent unmixing of European populations. Now, historically, however, keep in mind there is one boundary dissolving here that is indeed new. For much of the late 19th century and the 20th, uh, and much the first half of the 20th century, there was, there was what uh, 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 Du Bois called the color line. There was very distinctly a boundary that was completely invisible, but absolutely firm, legally entrenched in nation after nation from Australia to Germany to Russia, which excluded 
the majority of the world of the so-called yellow races of Arabs or Near Easterners and of Africans. This boundary has dissolved. This boundary no longer exists the way it has existed at the high point of imperialism. And if you think that anyone can reconstruct it, that Trump can reconstruct it for the United States, you fantasize. And at that point where you begin to fantasize, you can watch out and you can actually see this happening, not from Mr. Trump himself, but from the more right-wing nationalist uh, environment in which, uh, which picks up on these ideas, what you can see is sovereignty panics. Yeah. That is explanations that essentially reason away the world as it is and invent a world with which they can live, however, can live only at extraordinary costs of human dignity and human rights. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Because of time, that is, I mean, I would love to continue that, but we, I think we could take a couple of uh, questions okay. that uh, um, on that, I mean, I would love to hear it uh, further and discuss uh, with you. Yes, please. Uh, Please, please speak slowly and clearly. My hearing, especially after speaking, uh, is not so um, good. Well, th thank you very, very much for this wonderful discussion. Um, I'm, I'm quite persuaded by your, by your uh, resistance of the analogy between the interwar and now. Um, however, I'm less persuaded by your, your, your parting comments. Um, it seems to me that um, when it comes to migration, in particular, that that is the one thing that 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 um, that is possible to reverse in some sense. I mean, Salvini recently showed in Italy that you can close a border to a country. I mean, it is possible to um, it is possible to to do something. In some ways, people are getting elected to do that. Um, where I where I'd like to hear more from you about is where I think a, a real power is lurking in your comments is about the inescapability of globalization and the false, I mean, there were, there were, as you know, there were in the, De Gaulle once made a bid to get out of the American, the Anglo-American financial system. There have been bids to get out of, of globalization or to modify it. But what we have now is sort of um, performed um, moves to autonomy that are not, that are not real in that sense. So, so, you know, Trump, acting as if he's going to build a national industrial board and revert to a sort of Franz List, you know, you know Friedrich Listian economy is, 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 is not true, but he's still performing that as a sort of possibility. And the dissatisfaction of an electorate that still thinks that, that of a portion of electorate that still thinks that possible strikes me as the real danger, but that the migration thing is the actual one thing that they can do uh, something about. Well, there is, not a single answer to your question because it, it breaks down into a variety of issues and problems uh, and uh, I would have to talk with you some more which way you want to go. Now, let's first talk about nationalism. Uh, nationalism is still and certainly can, is still and once and is once again a very powerful bonding force. Uh, now, why that is, why the nation is such a successful construction is actually rather puzzling and it is very difficult to configure. But let's leave that aside uh, for a moment. Let's simply insist that it is and is once again a powerful so a societal bonding mechanism. Uh, what then is interesting for me is that there are in Europe 
a whole series and they are nationally specific. You can observe this in France, you can observe this in Germany in a different way, you can observe this in Poland, and yet again very differently in a very exciting way. Um, so some is not so exciting, some is simply odd. Uh, in Austria, um, what you can see is first of all a huge amount of repetition compulsion. That is, people repeat what already has been before, uh, what has been there before. But if you look very, that is, you return to the 1920s and 30s, and if you're clever, you return to the 1860s, 70s, and 80s to the 19th century, and then you have suddenly, you're out of nationalism comes patriotism, uh, a sense of. Uh, ethno-nationality uh, and a long tradition of uh, fairly reputable and some very enlightened thinkers. But this is all repetition of history. And repetition of history never happens that way. What I find, what I find much more interesting and what I find, since I am not sharing that view, I find much more dangerous is the recomposition of fragments of nationalism into a new composite. Now, if you ask me what the kind of crucial moment is when a new nationalism has arisen, I think this is the moment in which the question of the, the, the sovereignty paradox that you have nations but can't be sovereign is resolved. So, once nationalists, as they mightily strive at the moment but haven't found a solution yet, once nationalists become European nationalists, Europe, that is nationalist Europeans, in whichever way they do it, and there are efforts everywhere, both on a Congress level as well as on an ideological level, as well as on a, on a, on a, on a social uh, economic level, right? Once that happens, then we have a distinct new nationalism that, that actually will become a very powerful force in Europe. Uh, so that, that would be, there are many more elements to, to, to your question, but that's the way I would like to answer it. Um, again, we are really running out of time, so a, a short question and a short answer okay. uh, from your side, uh, from your side uh, too. But I mean, um, it's really unfortunate because about those borders that we could talk about it actually, and you can't close the borders in a way. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Well, thank you very, very much for your inspiring talk. Uh, very most briefly formulated questions or remarks. First is a question. In the uh, discourse on nation, nationhood, nationality, finally nationalism, uh, I insist on this distinction because it's very important methodologically. France is always left out. I mean, uh, we, we talk about Germany all the time. The, mo the strongest nation in Europe was the nation with the strongest nationalism also that spreads over the over European Union is France. Uh, I think it, it's time to, uh, to devise a kind of critique the politischen Vernunft in order to also deal with this special case within Europe. Second, uh, my background is economics. I'm interested in the theory of economic behavior. It's quite easy to devise a, the theoretical foundations of the existence of collective identities of which nationhood is only one particular case. It has to do with the Hobbesian view of the deep insecurity of the individual, which can be, which can be, uh, how do I say, not, not, not cured, but which can be reduced by, by cooperation. 
and all collective identity as a means to secure cooperation. Nation, nationhood being maybe the most comprehensive uh, uh, instrument in this, in this respect. We, sh we should really tr uh, get our terminology a little bit, not a little bit, uh, uh, fundamentally more, more, uh, uh, hmm, uh, I like the term, uh, more subtle to, as I said, to, to distinguish between nationhood, nationality, the potential for national sovereignty, and nationalism, which is the exaggeration, of course. And the third question, I leave with that. Thank you very much. Well, the short answer to that is that <laughs> I, I had to read through the entire nationalism and nationality literature uh, in the, over this past summer, uh, which was not uh, a very pleasant task, I have to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that would not quite confirm your point of view uh, in terms of the nationalism literature. Uh, France is very centrally uh, uh, is is indeed the is is the model for a uh, uh, civic nation. Uh, the the problem begins. Uh, well, France is also, and that is less well known, is also one of the major th sources of thinking about nationality mostly small thinkers, but there is one big thinker who is really very important, is still important today, that is, uh, who is otherwise, is known for mostly other things, but de Tocqueville mm -hmm. is of course one of the great thinkers of nationality, of nationality, that is, um, and not of nation, not of nationalism. Now, nationalism is a slightly different problem because there, France has a very peculiar history in which nationalists separate from the civic nation that is firmly entrenched, and hence nationalism in France is, is, is a very problematic and very difficult uh, mo movement, uh, uh, political movement, which reminds you, if anything, of the fact that nationalism should be separated from patriotism and nation making as uh, and state making so okay thank you very much um, I would as I said I would love to continue and uh, to hear more and then to discuss but our time is uh, our time is up uh, thank you very much uh, Michael for uh, for this actually also with the detour and it is reminding us that the kind of the differences also but the kind of the mechanisms that we could find similar uh, mechanisms in terms of uh, what is uh, very important for our lives, everyone's lives uh, today in today's uh, world. Uh, please join me for thanking uh, Michael for this conversation. Thank you.